So the time will be shown on the graph here. Okay, good night. Uh, my name is Uri Denver Chacon Hernandez. I'm one from CBPF here in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Um, okay, uh, sometimes uh, some hybrid uh, systems like uh, like uh, superconducting spin bouts could have some not usual uh, behaviors, especially magnetical behaviors. Uh, uh, down for the TC, like this. This behavior is not usual, but this is not a. Th uh, this is not always happening in all samples. In this case, we have two samples here and here that have the same uh, structure, and this structure uh, and these samples are make it uh, some uh, measurements characterization measurements where we compare which me, uh, which measurement uh, or which sample could have this this thing or this be, this kind of behavior so in this case uh, we found a which a parameter could be relevant to take this uh, this behavior uh, that we call a uh, anti lens uh, behavior because the uh, Magnetical response is like a reversal. That, uh, but but this is not a uh, like a, I suppose we have in these kind of things. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today we'll talk about the dissipative mechanism and thermal diffusion and annihilation of kinematic vortex and anti-vortex pair. To study uh, this phenomenon, we use the GTDGL formalism. It's a generalization by the GTDGL ordinary theory proposed by Schmidt. The GTDGL equations was proposed by Bot Stobin and Kramer in the 1978 and was derived for microscopic fury in the dirt limit and temperature close of critical one. Uh, True studies the thermal effects and dissipative mechanisms involved in this process, we, we cope with, with the DGL equation, the classical diffusion equation, where the total energy dissipated was a student solve the Helmholtz free energy uh, the theorem, where we have three kinds of dissipative mechanism. The first one is the normal current, the second one is relation of uh, relaxation of psi and the uh, excitation, uh, ohmic excitation of the core of vortex, and the last one is due to uh, relaxation of density of super electrons. Um, and as a result of heat diffusion, we have an uh, increase of the number of vortex and anti-vortex pairs and decrease of the vortex velocity, right? Uh, and the main kind of dissipative mechanism is due to normal current. Uh, but the terms involve the psi are not dispersible, are very important to correct the equation. All right, more picture and uh, some graphics is uh, on the poster. All right, uh, poster uh, 16, <laughs> that's my poster, thank you. <laughs> Good evening. 
So for the last two of these conferences, I've been presenting in my talk on, on these metastable vortex lattice phases and how they transition back to the ground state. And I figured this time I would talk about something entirely different and relegate this to a poster instead for those who are interested. So just to remind you, in magnesium diboride, uh, the structural vortex lattice phase diagram, so how the vortex lattice is arranged relative to the crystalline lattice, shows three different phases. And if we heat or cool across some of these uh, equilibrium phase transitions, the vortex lattice actually is stuck in a metastable state. And moreover, we've shown uh, previously that this uh, metastability is not due to vortex spinning, and we've speculated that maybe it's vortex lattice domain boundaries that's responsible. So we spent quite a bit of time studying the dynamics or kinematics of how this can be driven back to the ground state uh, by applying uh, successive small AC fields. And there are two primary results on the poster. One is outlined on the left, where we have either supercooled or superheated the vortex lattice across the same second order phase transition, and then looked at how it relaxes back. And as you can see in the top left diagram, that looks like a discontinuous or first order like transition, where the ground state domains develop as you go left to right, and the metastable domains basically decrease in intensity. That's the middle one. In contrast, if you look at the bottom left, you can see that uh, for the superheated case, the transition back to the ground state is more continuous or second order like. So there's this clear dichotomy between uh, the superheated and the supercooled vortex lattice configuration. On the right, we've then studied the supercooled in some more detail where we looked at how we drive this back, uh, basically defining an order parameter as how much is left in the metastable state, and looked at how that uh, decreases as you apply successfully more and more AC cycles to it and found an interesting scaling behavior uh, that allows us to collapse most of the data onto a single curve. And for more details, come and look at the poster. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Fasano. So good afternoon, everybody. So actually, this work is uh, from two students from our lab at Bariloche, but they were not able to attend to the conference. So I'm presenting the work in a poster. Uh, so the, the students are uh, Maria Lourdes Amigo. She is a PhD student at our lab that's growing the iron selenite samples together with Gladys Nieva and uh, Raul Cortez Maldonado, who performed the magnetic decoration experiments. So during the last four or five years, we have been growing, well, mainly Gladys and her students, have been growing iron selenite samples, iron selenite sulfide and iron tellurite samples in our lab. And we have been trying during this time to observe the vortex lattice uh, with uh, magnetic decoration. And at the beginning, it was very difficult. It seems like uh, lambda was too big and there were so many magnetic background in the samples that we were not able to see the vortices. But uh, during the last two years, they somehow changed the growing parameters of the samples. And so we were able to see vortices in these samples. Probably you don't see them <laughs> because the pictures, well, but you have to believe me that these white dots here in the, in the picture are vortices as we normally observe them with magnetic decorations. Uh, we see they are the, an edge of the sample here. This edge of the sample is around 45 degrees of the A crystallographic axis of iron selenite. And uh, when we do a Fourier transform of the digitalized vortex positions, what we observe is this kind of uh, Fourier transform, indicating that the structure is uh, has, is not hexagonal, but seems to be square-like. And there is also a lot of disorder in this structure that you can see directly in the picture. Which is interesting is the generally close to the edge of the sample, this square-like structure is ordered along this direction at 45 degrees of the crystallographic axis. But when you go into the, the inner part of the sample, uh, the lattice becomes more disordered. And uh, you lose, you, you see a ring in the, in the Fourier transform. So it seems like the pinning in these samples is so weak that the edge of the sample is 
somehow uh, inducing some ordering of the lattice. Uh, this is a picture of vortices in iron, uh, selenium, uh, sulfide, and what probably you're not able to see that here, but in the poster it's more clear, is that we have some lines where we have more vortices, and they seem to be like twin boundaries. And in that case, we also observe some regions with uh, square symmetry. So this is quite interesting because the magnetic field that we applied to observe vortices was just five ersters. Normally, one see these kind of square structures when you have IBCO or, or cerium cobalt uh, indium five at very large fields when the vortex structure locks somehow with the uh, uh, superconducting parameter that has some anisotropy. But here we observe this square-like structure at very low fields. And at larger fields, we were not able to see the lattice, and uh, the temperature was, was also an issue. This is at 2.3 Kelvin. At larger temperatures, we didn't observe also the vortices. So for more details, come to my poster. Good evening. Um, my name is Rodolfo Ribeiro Gomes. I am a PhD student at Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro. And today I will present a poster where the, the title of the work is Paramagnetic Excited Vortex States in Superconductors. Uh, in this work, we will discuss a topic the, that was first studied by Abkhazov. When he discovered the vortices in 1957, he used uh, solutions for the, the first order equations that are shown here. He, he didn't solve the, the second order Gisbrandau equations. Um, using the, these equations, he was able to to insert the, the solution into the Gibbs free energy and show that the, this energy uh, has the, give the, the triangular and triangular lattice and for the square lattice. He, in our study, we will, ah, in, in his study, he showed that the, he used a superconductor that has periodic boundary conditions. So the, the superconductor is infinite. In our study, we consider a finite superconductor. And in this case, we can split the, the kinetic energy in three terms. And we can see that in this way, we have a, a term that gives the, uh, a contribution from the boundaries. In our case, we consider this contribution. And we consider as an example a uh, superconductor that is a long cylinder, but uh, with uh, a boundary. So in, in practice, we consider a uh, superconductor in two dimensions. In, and we consider the case when we have an um, applied field and we switch off this field. In this case, we can show in this work that we can see solutions that have a vortex inside the superconductor and the Gibbs free energy of this state is smaller than the energy of the normal state. Uh, this state we call excited vortex state. And we show also in this work that this state has a positive magnetization. So it's paramagnetic. And we have another features in this work that is we can calculate the magnetic field inside the vortex core. And that's it. Um, my my poster. We have another features that we can I can show you in my poster. My poster is in panel number four. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hi. Um, I'm I'm Jose Benito. I'm going to present this poster. So the first part of the talk. Maybe it's going to be familiar for you because of Cynthia Reijas' talk. Uh, so here I present two very disordered images. 
but only one of them is truly random. Uh, if you take a closer look in the in the happy uniform image, you can see that the particles are very well distributed among all the space. Meanwhile, in the random distribution, the, there is a, a space where the density is higher and other space where the density is smaller. So, because uh, in the random distribution, there is bunching, which is a, a fundamental property of, of random. So, one way to differentiate them is calculating the factor structure of, of the distribution. If we, took the, if we calculate the structure factor of the random, we have a constant line. And if we calculate the, the structure factor of the hype uniform, we will have a constant line except at very long length scales that we have a drop in the in a line. So that means that at very uh, long length scales, the fluctuations disappear. So what I did is calculated this factor structure for several images of vortices of different materials to find if as uh, Cynthia Rajar says, that the disorder in the vortex lattice is hyper uniform. Uh, so I calculate this factor structure, so it, it drops for all the, all the image with an exponential decay of an exponent between 1 and 0 0.5. So this is important because um, in this paper, it said that if you put like a uh, high penny for pin in land scales, it can enhance critical current. So I, some of the, uh, the materials have a random pin potential and some of them have a high penny for pin potential. And if you have, you want more information about this poster, I'm in, in number five. So thank you for your attention. Uh, first, uh, I'm not a doctor, <laughs> but thanks. Uh, <laughs> my name is Jaime Neses. I'm a PhD student at Federal University of Pernambuco. And in this work, we investigate uh, non-uniform vortex distributions in clean superconductors when subjected to a uh, external force field. So the question is, if a non-uniform vortex distribution can be arranged in a globally ordered structure. For example, you know that in situations of uniform density, the low energy configuration is the, the because of lattice. But little is known about the possible other configurations that we can observe in non-uniform uh, distributions. So to investigate that, we suggest uh, a simple method to calculate the external potential capable of accommodating a, a group of interacting particles uh, that we can apply for VORS in a low energy configuration following a specific density profile. And the interesting point is that we observed uh, using numerical simulations, uh, molecular dynamic simulations, that when the density uh, of VORS approaches the density profile of a conformal lattice, a uh, globally ordered structure emerges. For example, here, we have three different shapes of the external potential. And the first one here, when the density uh, of force approaches the density profile of a uh, conformal lattice, in this case, the logarithmic map, uh, the system of force self-organizes in a single crystal, in a globally ordered structure. And in this situation, when we have uh, the density varying just in one direction, the only possible transformation that satisfies the analyticity 
of the conformal map is the logarithmic map that has these typical configurations of arcs and pillars that we observe here. And here the dots represent the vortex positions, the polygons represent the uh, Voronoi construction, and the same uh, in this other picture here. So in the poster we are going to discuss in detail the, the different shapes of the external potential and configurations and this other here is other conformal uh, transformation, the philotaxis map. And when the vortex density approaches this uh, let's profile, the system also self-organized in this globally ordered structure. And we can see here this spiral configuration typical of the uh, philotaxis transformation. So for more details about the simulation methods and its configurations, see the poster and thank you. Hi everybody. Uh, I use, there is no transparency. Oh, thank you. Uh, I use my opportunity to explain my talk here, my, my work here. I will divide it in two parts. One, the threshold temperature with type 1 and type 2 interchange in mesoscopic superconductors at Bogboni limit. Here I calculated uh, the, this diagram, that diagram uh, A in function of temperature, and find this, this uh, this different uh, behavior in this side, uh, we can see the Meissner state and normal state. And in this, in this part of the diagram, we see uh, the three different phases. Yeah. I, uh, in, in my idea is in this part, this behavior is looks like a type two superconductor, while in this one is a type 1 superconductor. Uh, it is in agreement with the calculation of magnetization, since in this, uh, the magnetization, in this case here, it is uh, in this side. And you can see that it is a second order phase transition with uh, uh, internal of this superconducting state uh, appear uh, first order phase transition because the entrance of the Watts. While in the this side here we have only one first order phase transition in magnetization. It is the first part of the poster there. And the second part is magnetic property of type two superconductors with pinning sites. I will talk uh, uh, more or less, not of course, with the uh, richness of results presented by uh, Ivan, but I will show only one uh, very simple example of uh, magnetization and uh, currents uh, when I introduced pinning in different parts of this mesoscopic system. That's all. Thank you. Okay, so in this poster, I will present uh, the result of two different experiments, which are made uh, using neutron scattering in a pure sample of niobium. So this has made be with uh, Annie Brulé from the LLB on Charles Simon, which Charles is now at the ILL in Grenoble in France. So for the first experiment, the question was, uh, uh, is it possible to measure with a good enough precision the, the finite size of uh, a vortex crystallite in a sample of, go of good purity. Uh, the problem with neutron scattering is that we normally we have a limited resolution for the, the main Bragg peaks, uh, the Bragg peak with S, S of Q. And uh, we show here that using a, a time of flight method, it's possible to increase the resolution and the definition of the Bragg peaks 
and to measure the, the size of the vortex crystallite as, as function of the field to compare after with, uh, with different models of critical currents. And for the second experiment, um, uh, we have used uh, another spectrometer, which is uh, very well suited to, m to measure the flux linearities at very low field. So typically uh, for field less than 100 of, of Gauss, which is uh, not so easy with classical spectrometer. So the idea was to, to follow uh, the, the change of the vortex lattice structure at very low field when uh, in niobium, which is uh, as you know, uh, a type two superconductor, but very close to be type one. And you have competition between attractive and, and uh, repulsive interaction. And because of this competition, you have uh, different phases which are appearing that we can uh, study and follow as function of temperature and field uh, with no scattering. So this is uh, what I, I show. And I will be happy to discuss with you of the result. Thank you. Good evening. So uh, I'm Lucas da Silva. Uh, and this is a, a, a worker with cooperation uh, with Durval Rodrigues Jr. We are from uh, University of São Paulo, campus of Lorena. Uh, so the name of my work is e Effective Artificial Pin Center in MGB2 Superconducting Books. So the main uh, the main goal our work is to, to try to increase the critical current density in, in MGB2 books. So uh, we try to increase or to, to improve all of these uh, characteristics of material. For example, in the grain boundaries, connectivity, uh, including crystalline defects, uh, porosity, controlling the porosity, uh, controlling the MG, MG uh, MGO ground and far doping. Here, uh, effectively in, the, in this uh, in this work, we try to introduce uh, other uh, other diabrites. The diabrites that we include is the vanadio diabrites. It's because we try to include punctual defects. The vanadio diabrites has the same crystalline structure of the MGB2. So we can try to include uh, uh, effective artificial pin center in this material. Uh, and uh, in the same time that we include this vanadium dabrite, we include to, uh, some, some carbon dope. In this, in this example, uh, or in this work, we include the silicon carbide, that it's uh, one of the best doping for this material. And here uh, I have some results, my, but here uh, I show you some uh, the principal results. Uh, here is a, a high resolution a TM image where we can see a vanadium gram. Uh, and here I call your attention for the size of this vanadium dibrite gram, that it's almost the same, uh, the same size of the the coheren co coheren coherence length of the uh, magnesium dibrite. And the here I show you the uh, a graph of critical current density versus applied magnetic field, where these blue lines are, are the, the samples with addition of uh, vanadium dibrite. And the here I show you that uh, we can improve the critical current density under high applied magnetic field. So, uh, for more, more details, I, I, I invited you to, to, to find me in the poster search. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I found the vortex class transformation in the surface mixed state of a molybdenum rhenium superconductor. Basically, this molybdenum rhenium superconductor is 
uh, low TC superconductor having TC around 10 Kelvin. And uh, we prepared the sample by arc, arc, arc melting furnace. And uh, it's a polycrystalline. So what we did, we did the temperature dependence of resistivity and heat capacity in zero magnetic field and in presence of magnetic field. And what we found when we did the measurement in zero field, temperature dependence of resistivity and heat capacity, we saw that transition temperature was same. I mean, in the resistivity as well as in the heat capacity. But when we did the measurement in magnetic field, we saw the superconducting transition in temperature dependence of resistivity vanishes. I mean, it shows the zero resistivity well above the onset of the bulk heat capacity transformation, which gives an evidence of uh, the surface superconductivity in this system, which we confirmed further by coating the sample by silver metal. And we saw the uh, surface superconductive suppressed. Then we saw that means there is surface mixed state. I mean, there is a vortex, mat vortex matter in the surface region of the superconductor. And uh, we give this, I mean, this model we use, flux spot model, which uh, is given by the, the Hertz and Swartz in 1960s around. And there they say that because of the surface roughness of the superconductor, some of the flux lines can penetrate and form uh, the flux spots in the surface region of superconductor. We analyzed the data temperature dependence of resistivity uh, with the help of the vortex glass model, and we saw, uh, and we saw, can I have the pointer, please? And we saw this, uh, this the green line is shows the uh, superconducting transition temperature by the heat capacity measurement, which is the bulk uh, measurement. And this black line shows the superconducting transition temperature by resistivity measurement. So this region is the surface superconducting region where we saw the, all this uh, vortex phase uh, vortex liquid to glass transformation all in this region where this. Uh, this orange line shows the TCH where the resistivity goes to zero and the glass temperature is coinciding. So which says that it, the glass for, uh, vortex glass is forming in the surface region of the superconductor. And uh, we estimated the critical exponent regarding to this vortex glass, uh, critical region of the vortex glass. And we saw this critical exponent is saturating near to the 2.4. Whereas in the literature, we found that for the three dimensional vortex glass, this critical exponent is more, always more than 2.7, which, which again gives an indication that this is happening in the surface region of superconductor. Thank you very much. If you are interested, uh, I have a poster number 13 there for the further information. Good evening, my name is Nicolas Vizarin. I'm from the Sao Paulo State University in Bauru. And I'm talking about the influence of pinning strength and size on type two superconducting thin films with Kagomet pinning. Well, the motivation for us to study this issue is that the recent experimental data showing should matching features in this kind of systems, which is in contrast with previous simulations. In previous simulations, did they not find any critical current peak uh, due to the vortex lattice being not ordered. So we decided to simulate the system and vary the pinning parameters. So we used numerical simulations to investigate the submatching fields with Kagomet pinning at zero temperature. And through simulated annealing technique, we search for the vortex ground states and then we integrate the Langevin equations where we have the vortex vortex direction, the vortex pinning direction, and the vortex port current interaction. Uh, some of the results, we have the vortex ground states that we find through simulated annealing, and we found some ordered vortex ground states for BBV one third and BBV two thirds. These ordered vortex ground states, as a consequence, uh, show us critical force peaks for these values of field, and we corroborate the experimental results. But uh, some of the, pre the critical peaks, for example, BBV two-thirds, the peak changes as the pinning strength changes. So we decided also to analyze the pinning eff size effect. And when we choose the pinning size close to that uh, of the previous simulations, we found that the vortex ground state is not ordered. So if you want more information, more results, we can talk at the poster. My poster is poster 18. Thank you very much for your attention.
Good evening, everyone. I'm Roland Villa. I'm from Argonne National Lab. Um, I'm not going to tell too much about the poster because I want you to come to the poster. We tried to uh, answer a question, what does it take to um, actually see the appearance of creep when you field cool a system? Usually, um, in order to see creep, you have to bring the system of vortices out of equilibrium. This you can do by either zero field cooling and then apply a field or by rotating the field. And I think we have found a set of ingredients um, which you need to actually see creep appearing upon cooling um, in the field. And uh, the hints on what ingredients you need is uh, an anisotropic superconductor. Uh, you need pinning, obviously, in order to have creep. And um, tilted magnetic fields is a third ingredient. And in order to observe it, which we believe we also did um, in experiments done by uh, Hermann, Isabel, and uh, Jose, um, you need very high experimental resolution. Here we see the velocity as a function of temperature upon um, uh, heating a field cooled, a zero field cooled state and then cooling the field cooled state. And the velocity scale here is in nanometers per minute, so you need pretty high uh, resolution. Thank you very much. Hi, good evening. My name is Yu Taoxing from uh, Ufi, Brazil. So my work is about superconductivity in nickel bismuth system. So the question is quite easy. As we know, pure nickel and pure bismuth, the bulk is not a superconductor. But if we deposit one above another, the system, the bilayer system is a superconductor. So the phenomenon is quite easy. But interpretation is quite complicated. There are many different interpretations. For example, the nickel induced uh, superconductivity uh, interface induced uh, superconductivity in bismuth or in nickel layer. Or there is a uh, amorphous bismuth at the interface or something else. And we prepared samples at room temperature and at 4.2 Kelvin. We studied the superconductivity and microstructure of the cross-section very carefully. And with our result, I could say that this problem has been solved. So I use game over. I know this is too strong, sorry, <laughs> because I need your challenge. If you want to see what, why, and how, come to my post, please. And you won't miss my poster because when we go out this room, the first poster you will say is my poster. <laughs> Thank you. And lastly, uh, Dr. Vandelaar. Uh, good evening, ev everybody. Uh, my poster, uh, the title of my poster is Kinematic Vortices Induced by Constriction in Gapless Superconductors. Uh, this work uh, begins wi with uh, the observation that in, in superconductors, uh, in, uh, in gap-like uh, superconductors, Without any defect, uh, the current, the superconducting current density uh, increases in in the in the middle of the the system. So I try to uh, induce this increase, this uh, increase of the current, uh, by introducing a constriction uh, made by a blind with blind uh, slits here. And with this uh, geometry, uh, we can be able to reproduce uh, kinematic vortices in, in gapless like superconductor. What I mean gapless or gap like superconductor, uh, I'm using the generalized time dependent Ginzburg Landau and set this. Uh, relaxation, basically this is the relaxation of the order parameter as zero, and then I, I have the Schmidt uh, TDGL, uh, or 
and this is a gap, gapless like that I am calling. And otherwise, I, I put another value here uh, to compare with uh, a gap like superconductor. Here is the voltage uh, as a function of the applied current density, and we see uh, the difference between the, these two systems. Uh, well, I've been my poster. Uh, I would like to, to thank FAPEP, FAPESP for financial support. Okay, thank you very much.